You are now rocking with Bizmode. Let's get into Bizmode. What is Bizmode? Bizmode is entrepreneurship at its highest level. Bizmode is flow state. Bizmode is that hunger pain you feel. Bizmode is success by your own definition. Bizmode is operating from abundance. Bizmode is what you make it. This is Bizmode. What up, though? I am your host, Alex Bruno. I am the founder of Bruno Group, Inc., a California law firm helping entrepreneurs and businesses with their legal stuff. Bizmode family, welcome back. Alex Bruno here. And today I want to introduce you to Craig Brink. Craig is the CEO of Rat Pack Controls. What Rat Pack does is they provide lighting for film and television production. They also provide lighting for live events. Craig dropped some gems on us today. One of those gems was for all you product developers and makers out there. When you're developing a product or creating a product, you've got to create that product with your customer in mind. I know we say this a lot and we say it intentionally to be repetitive, that knowing what your customer needs or knowing what problem your customer has is of the utmost importance. Um, You need to understand what their problem is, understand what their need is, and to build to solve that need and solve that problem. Craig, Craig identified that there and we, we explored that with him. He also talked about how he keeps his team involved and how he has his team get ingrained in the company and they feel like they're part of the company and they're not just punching a clock. Well, enough about my takeaways. I want to hear about yours. So hit us up, uh, bizmodepodcast.com. Um, let's get on with Craig. Hope you enjoy the show. Craig, uh, welcome to Bizmode. Hey, thank you, Alex. It's a, it's a privilege. Well, it's a privilege to have you on, and I, I really appreciate you being on. Well, why don't we start with you telling us about Rat Pack? And for the people out there, before you start telling us about Rat Pack, Rat Pack spelled R A T P A C. There's no K at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so, Rat Pack is a company that manufactures lighting controls for motion picture and TV. We also sell and rent those products mostly in North America, but a little bit overseas. Okay. Uh, the company was started about almost 11 years ago. And then what kind of, what was your like source of inspiration to, to start, you know, to start the company? The source, uh, what's interesting, I was working on a TV show. I was uh, a lighting professional known as a rigging gaffer. So I was my job to install the electric. And we had a budget we had a budget crisis. And so we had to come up with a, a little bit of a creative way to light the set and save money. And so that ended up in a little bit of discovery process that ended up with something like, not too much like the products we have now, but on the path. So you didn't intend to start off with a business. Tell us about like how it kind of evolved from you just it helping you to it becoming a business. So my intention was to save money for a TV show. Um, and, and that's always the case in a TV show. There's always, there's always budget issues and lighting has a big part of the budget. So we had to come up with a way to save money and still maintain the lighting concepts from the director of photography. In fact, I was challenged to save $5,000 per episode, which I did. And it's the first time ever a production manager had brought me a bottle of wine. It was his way of saying thank you. He said, I've never done this before, but we didn't change the lighting and you saved money. So he was he was very happy. No, that's not, that sounds like something that <laughs> that would make someone happy when you save money and you make it look better. <laughs> it was it, it it was a win-win and it really wasn't it wasn't a product that we made. I, I adapted things to make it work. But in the adapting of products, I realized that we needed a product that would do this. And I was introduced to an engineer at that point, with, again, with the intention of just making things that I could use on my own uh, TV shows, or at least TV shows I was working on. Right. And I think offline, we were talking about, at some point, you're like, wait a minute, not, so could, it might not just be my TV shows, but I could, might be able to 
use it for some other purpose or sell it to other people. Yeah, right. And I, I think that's the way there's a lot of inventions. You, you, you design it to make something better for yourself and you see that it has, it has, it has a bigger use. And in my case, not only did it have a bigger use, but I realized at some point that it actually made the work, the work um, experience safer for people because it involved giving people a way to do the lighting with a lot less cable. The cables are very heavy um, and they take up a lot of space on the set. There's just a lot of reasons why having less cable will be beneficial to everybody. You, you end up with an idea to make it easier for yourself and then you end up with a company and, and then tell me what the company looked like or looks like now. Well, so pre COVID, okay. We were at 72 employees. Um, with, with a healthy number of sales and rentals and new products. Um, so that's where we were at pre-COVID. And we're about three quarters of the way back right now. The industry is busy right now. Um, when I started, it was, it was myself and an engineer. And it was the two of us for quite a while. And then it was one more person for quite a while. And we stayed under 10 for at least the first two years. Um, and then in order to fund making the products, I had to basically sell. I had, um, I had rental homes I had purchased for my retirement. So I had to sell all those and basically cash in all my chips. And then I was able to expand the business. But I, I hit a ceiling again at that point. And that's when I brought in business partners and the company continued to grow. So that would be about year four. So what, what was the turning point for you to say, you know what, I'm, if, if, in order for this to be successful, I need to get more capital. I actually need to increase my stake, so to speak. What, what kind of pushed you for that? Um, you know, I realized that if I wanted to keep the pace going, I needed more capital. I I could have done it without more capital and just built it up a little bit slower and maintain 100% ownership. But at some point I realized that the pace became more important in order to in order to grow the business the way I wanted to. And so I had to give up some equity in order in order to do that and we did that for you know a period of time until I went into the next phase of it, which was selling a portion of the business. But um, the pace was always super important to me because I wanted to make sure that as we got these new ideas out, that somebody else wasn't coming behind us and doing the same thing. And my motto has always been that when people go to imitate our bicycle, we'll be building airplanes. So I'm not really worried about them imitating what we did a year ago or two years ago. And you, and you learn early in business that um, banks aren't interested in giving you money. Uh, that's kind of the exception. And it takes a long time to earn a bank's trust. I mean, that's another thing. And, and for a while, I actually used what we call hard money loans. So I would go to people uh, in one company in particular, and you know, we pay between 17 and 22% for short-term loans. When I say short term, they're probably around 12 months. So I had to quickly make a profit from the capital I was given, turn it into a product, turn it into a profit. So then I could turn around and, and pay him back and then generate the next loan. Because with the hard money loans, loan two could not be acquired until loan one was paid off. And so I did that for did that for a couple of years as well. It's it's an inter- it's an interesting way you financed because especially with the hard money loan situation and but but that kind of for me it further emphasizes your ability to say that you're all in because you wouldn't be doing that if you weren't all in oh yeah i had a lot to lose at that point because i had already i had already um divested myself of all my future opportunities for retirement and I would no longer be able to work in my same industry because I was not keeping my hours up in the union. 
So I really didn't have a way to go backwards. Um, I think we talked about before an example, and that would be uh, supposedly when Cortez was with the, his group of sailors and they were looking for the gold. When they got to the shore, he burned the ships and basically said, look, we're either getting the gold or, or you're dead because we're not going back the way we came in. And that was sort of the way it was for me. I wanted to be all in. And at some point I had, you know, I'll say this. I had a pretty high degree of confidence in it working because my customers were and are my friends. These were people that I could go directly to and show them something that I knew would be a solution for them. Uh, it, it's the equivalent of, to make a bad a bad analogy, is the equivalent of the fact that they had never had a glass before to drink water and always had to drink out of their, their hands cup. And I said, well, what about a glass? Like, well, glass? Why didn't somebody give us a glass before? And it was, it, it basically sold itself. And I, again, I was going to friends and there was no sales pitch. I knew what they needed because I worked in the same industry for so long. Sure. And, and so going to that next level with your first set of partners, who, who, how did you meet them? Uh, how did that come about? Yeah. So my, um, my accountant was keeping an eye on things and talking me into not driving it completely off the rails. And, but after about two and a half years, maybe almost into year three, he saw that this could actually potentially be really big. So he sent one of his clients to me who was looking for investments. And we met and talked, and that person eventually became a client. And then he saw his opportunity grow. And then my accountant became my business partner because he became very confident in our ability to grow. And then he had a, he had a contact in the banking world that became a contact, not as a banker, but just as, as an equity partner. So at, at that point, I had, um, I had partners and we were dividing it up in, in a certain way that I don't really get into, but um, I, I maintained the majority share and throughout, I never went down below 52%. So I used to say to my partners at a board meeting, I said, it is a democracy, but your votes don't count. <laughs> um, so we would, uh, and then, you know, we pretty, we mostly agreed because I, I knew the industry from the inside and it spent years in, and I was also the most, I had the most to lose. So they knew I wasn't going to do anything crazy. We're not any crazier than we already had done up to that point. Okay. So how, tell me how, it seems like you had good communication with them, your first partners. So how did you set expectations for them? Good question. Um, so we had we had meetings I would, even more frequently than quarterly. Probably every every two months we would meet in person, and we talked on the phone a lot. Um, I constantly kept in contact with them as what new TV shows were developing using our products. I actually took them to productions so they could see how the products were being used. And you even talk to some of the customers. So they had, um, though they weren't involved in the day-to-day -day operation, I was very transparent with them. I think is really what helped. And, and also remember, I'm dealing with my accountant, so there's really nothing I can hide at the end of the day anyway. And because <laughs> there was, you know, I didn't, I didn't start the process by saying, well, you should no longer be my accountant because I wanted her to be that level of, of transparency and, and trust and, um, and they could see, for example, month to month, how many, how many movie or TV productions were being added, the quantity of products being needed. Um, it was, it was a crazy growth period. It really was. Um, you know, we blew up to about, about 40, 42 employees. And this was in year, you know, by about year seven. And that's when I, we kind of reached a, a plateau. And really, I was, as I was telling you the other day, um, for me, the business development is a series of plateaus. You get to a certain point, and the only way to go is vertical. And that requires that you trust that what's on the other side of that vertical 
it's something you're going to be able to manage and deal with with the right personnel. And so we've been through several plateaus in where we are, and uh, hopefully there's more plateaus in front of us. We're, I don't think we, we leveled off obviously because of COVID, but um, we are we are going to hit new plateaus. I think early next year. I think it's hard for business owners because sometimes you're in it in the in the inside inside your business so much. It's hard to determine what a plateau looks like. Are there tools or some kind of like sense that you get to say we're here at a plateau or approaching one? You know, I think um, how how near we are to the vertical, the plateau, to me, depends on what's going on around us. For example, um, when when we see lighting, the lighting and motion picture industry continue to develop and become more more digital uh, because it's LED. We see that in order for us to continue to grow, we have to be able to provide the data for these lights. It's no longer just simply plugging it in. You're not using the on-off switch on the light. Everything's done remotely. And so that plateau for me was defined by wanting to have more integration with the product. So if we were going to have a new vertical and a new revenue stream, we had to be able to provide not just power for these lights and basic communication, but true data um, communication between all the lights and the programmer who sits on a TV show. Because on a TV show, you have somebody who sits at a, at a computer with monitors and they're basically controlling the show as they take their notes from the gaffer and the director of uh, photography. But another way to think about where the, where the vertical should be or where these plateaus should begin and end, a lot of it's driven internally. Um, for me, making new products is the majority of the reason I wake up in the morning. I don't want to wake up in the morning and do more of what I did yesterday, day after day after day. I push myself to discover what's needed. So I spend a lot of time in the field with customers. And I'll go visit a TV show or a movie and spend a couple of days there. And I'll observe what they're doing and I'll see what I'll call the workarounds. These are the things that people do in order to patch through and make, make something work that they currently have. And after I watch for a while, I'll pull someone aside and say, is that something I can do in an integrated system that you'd be interested in? And usually the answer is, please help me because this, this current workaround is not all that great. And so that challenge, that actually challenges me to go to the next level because solving problems, puzzles is really sort of at my core. And I think if you're, if you're building a business, that by definition means you're a builder. Uh, and by building a core, it means if I wasn't doing this, I'd be building something else. Nice. And nice. so that's that's the internal drive that gets you to the next plateau is identifying a need. And really for me, the money is, I know it sounds crazy, but the money is a collateral benefit. And I always assume that if I'm identifying a need and serving the customer and meeting the need and creating a product that's affordable and reliable that the money will just happen and so far the money has just happened <laughs> <laughs> well and we're going to get to one of those money questions well not actual money questions but we're going to get to that as how it happened but i just want to point out that it it's you, you you're doing what was generally advised for a company to do look for a need and try to solve that need but there's just, it's amazing how there's still so many companies that will just build a product and not know if someone's going to buy it. Yeah, the analogy I often use to people is why would you buy, uh, if you were a race car driver, why would you get in a car if you didn't have any, any input in the development of the design? And I've actually watched some of these programs on how this is done, and the, the driver works very closely with the team. And if you're going to win, you have to have everybody involved. You know, I think the reason a lot of companies don't do it is there's a lot of, I use the word backstory, a lot of backstory you have to develop an understanding of an industry in order to solve the problem. I couldn't, for example, show up at an airline tomorrow, identify the problem a week later, and then start solving it the week after that. You, you have to be immersed in it for a period of time and talk to people who are immersed in it. And, and then I think it, it also requires 
empathy for the person you're developing the product for. I, I'm going to make sure that the products I develop help the people that I spent my life with previous to this business. And it's somewhat important because July 1st of this year, I had double fusion surgery in my back. Mm, mm. And that's mostly because the equipment that we use when I start was incredibly heavy and it just takes a toll on the body. And I've always thought how great it would be if I was able to develop these products in order to help people have a healthier work life as a result. Mm-hmm. So it what, gets back to what, identifying yeah, the yeah. need. You have to be, I think there has to be some empathy for um, the people you're working with. And that requires a little bit of immersion in the industry that you want to provide it for and understanding of what they need. Uh, I mean, if I were developing a product for the plumbing industry, I'd have to, I'd have to understand what the what their pains and problems are, and anyway, you get you get the idea. Just you have to. I think you have to have a certain degree of empathy. No, that, that's great. Uh, like you, you do a good job, kind of sitting in the shoes because you've literally were in the shoes of, of the of, of the people you're trying to serve. So I see that that part of your business is really like gets you excited, it gets you gets you gets you hyped, so to speak being that visionary that needs that every company needs to have what's the not so fun parts of your business <laughs> well good <laughs> that's a great question um so we, we manufacture products and manufacturing is very hard um whenever i meet somebody who wants to go into manufacturing even if they want to make a similar product to mine i say wow you really you're going to need help I, i'd be willing to help you because you're it's going to be hard um because we start you know starting our manufacturing company from zero um, has so many hard elements, um, parts acquisition, you know, not just the capital, but developing, developing a consistent, um, consistent stream of, of parts and the timing of that to work with your capital and debt. If you can't, you can't have too much, you know, you have to balance your inventory and your sales. That's not a lot of fun. Um, developing, even developing the PCBs, the circuit boards, and the problems you can incur, and what happens when you miss a deadline and they get to you not working correctly. And there's a lot of processes and procedures you have to develop along the way that weren't something you would have known intuitively, Uh, whether it's a signature process for making sure that everybody involved in a project is signed off on, for example, a circuit board or a new switch. You know, I think also just... um, the hardest part of every business is people. And there are days that it's a lot of fun with people and there's days when it's not because there are days in which um, I'm I'm challenging my employees in a way that to me have to, maybe they haven't been challenged before. And some days my business partner is challenging me in ways I haven't been challenged before. And you know, I have to be willing to I have to be willing to grow. I have to understand that just because I've gotten here doesn't mean I'm done growing and done changing. As pre-COVID, was everybody centralized? We have um, most of our people are here in here in LA. Uh, that's where the assembly is. We have a we have a large shop in Atlanta where we do our rentals. We have a small shop in New York, and then we have satellite offices where we use other people's. Uh, businesses and then sub rent from them because we may have a product, for example, in New Orleans, but not at our own shop. And we managed that, or we did manage that through a lot of travel mm. Um, mm. by visiting all the satellites and making sure that we're all working together. Um, but the majority of the majority of the work is here, and the development is here, and the, the assembly. Um, so we develop everything from scratch. We go from concept to beta units, to trial units, to field units. Um, and we do all the assembly here. We don't, and we don't have, for example, uh, CNC machines where we're literally bending metal or making circuit boards, but we're doing all the design and doing all the assembly here and developing the, the work instructions and everything else to go with it. So speaking of like the team or like your, your employees, what, have you and like your leadership done to make sure that employees are not feeling like they're just 
punching the clock or or making a widget what what is it i am a big believer in the fact that every employee should come to work with the hope that they're going to be able to do something great later um i when i was a teenager i worked in factories i worked at a car wash um it wasn't always fun and i never want i never imagined myself staying at one of those places and so there's a couple ways that I think we give people the, the incentive to believe that it's that they're a bigger part of something other than making a widget. Uh, number one, I offer free education to anybody and regularly repeat that and remind them that we'll pay for the education, the books, all they have to do is do it on their time. Um, I also remind people, every time people come to me for a raise, I always ask them to raise the number. But I ask them to raise the number dramatically. And I tell them, if you want to come in for a 2 or 3% raise, it's cost of living, great, that's done, thank you very much. I, I always challenge people to shoot higher, that there's opportunity here that they have to, they have to be part of it. And so I have a couple, I, for example, my, um, my head of engineering at the moment, when he started me, he was working at Osh Hardware School as an inventory clerk. And worked his way through electronic school and, and has now become a major contributor. And so part of the reason people don't feel like they're just punching a clock is they've watched other people who used to just punch the clock who are now salaried employees who are uh, raising up their economic status uh, quite a bit. And the other, the other thing we, we did to ensure that is when I sold part of the company it's been about two and a half years ago. We took a decent chunk of that money and distributed it to about 12 people who had been with me since almost day one. And it was enough money that they could go out and buy a new car or whatever, but not a house. And my message to them was, we're in this together for the long haul if you want to be. There will be a benefit at the end. This is just my way of saying, don't worry about this transition. We are not going to uh, make any major changes you have to worry about. We're, we're going to keep going on this. Oh, wow. That's great. I, I love how you have it set up for your, your team and, and really incentivizing people to, to join. I'm, I'm so excited. I, I might have to pitch to you. <laughs> right. it's, you know what? It's super, it's super important to me that um, not everything every day at work is expected. I'll give you an example. Um, everybody came to work one day and I decided that we were all going to, we all go to a restaurant together once in a while. So I, but I needed a bus. So I hired a bus. I thought, you know, it's fun that we all go to a restaurant and a bus and have a long lunch, but let's have a mariachi band. We'll take over the bus and the restaurant. So we hired a band. And then when we got to the restaurant, I said, look, everybody, we're not going to do much more work today. So if you want to have a couple beers, have at it. And we, we, had a, we had a great time. And, you know, once in a while we'll do an ice cream truck or whatever. But I always want to remind people that even though it might seem like you're punching a clock every day, something unexpected could happen. No, that's great. Fun for me to do. So it's a little bit selfish. <laughs> no, I, I love it. Um, so yeah, invite me next time when, I guess after COVID, when there's a, there's a truck. At the- <laughs> I will. It's a lot of fun. And, and in the meantime, we provide lunch for everybody every Friday, oh, Cool. which we've been cool. doing since the, the first day of this business. So, uh, that's always a lot of fun because, well, now we have to eat the meal, but separately, but we would always have our meal together. And then I gave people a little more time to so go outside and throw the football and, you know, as a way to kind of ease into the weekend a little bit. Right. That and we, you know, like a lot of companies, we do spot rewards and recognition pieces. Um, and those are fun. I do less of those now because I try to, I try to have the floor manager or whoever the supervisor is, the person getting the award, give those out because it's really important to me that we develop what I call kingmakers here. I want people who have leadership to pass that leadership on others so that they, they understand that they're not, they're not 10 steps removed from leadership. They may only be four or three or two, depending on where they're at. That's very great 
<laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, it, and it works. You know, um, it's it's developing. You know, we're always trying to develop the idea that it's not just about us as business owners getting wealthy. Right. Um, right. I I had two people that I worked. I was talking the other day, and and, and they're my two leads. And I talked to them about spot rewards and the importance of giving those gift cards out. I didn't want to hold on to those gift cards that I was, that I was wondering why I didn't have more gift cards to give out yet. And the analogy I used to them, which you probably heard many times is, you know, I, money is a little bit like cow, cow manure. If you spread it out, things grow. And if you pile it up, it, it tends to stink. And so we try to have a certain amount of that spread out so that there can be growth. And I know it might sound a little bit idealistic, but, um, it actually works and it's, it's really, it is very rewarding to see people. I have a guy here, for example, who, when he started work the first year, he had to ride every day long distance on a bicycle. And when he bought a new car, I don't know, about two years ago, and then turned it in for a better car a few months ago, you know, I just gave him a high five because I felt like I got to watch that journey. I was a little bit a part of the journey. He did the work. But I was enjoying watching watching what he was doing. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that seems like a fun place to work and a fun place to be and, and, and be part of. But you had a big decision that you made recently. Yes. Um, well, uh, well, about two and a half years ago, I sold uh, 75% of the business. And again, it was back to that pace. I saw that we were... We were doing well and we were growing. Um, I felt like uh, the locomotive that was this company wasn't going to develop the engine fast enough. I needed to couple it to another, to a bigger engine. Uh, so we got involved with a private equity partner because they brought some capital and expertise that we just didn't have. And that has been, you know, that's a different part of it's another. That's another major plateau, right? Another right, major part right. of this journey. And I've learned a lot in the process. We, you know, we, we have to run board meetings on a, on a different level. We have to understand um, how to manage expectations on a different level. We have to do an internal audit every year. That's part of the private equity. Um, it just is something that they do. So, you know, you have to, you have to make your, your work super tight and we were it wasn't wasn't super difficult because i was uh since about week two of starting the business i was always on the path to to think about the exit strategy that was always on my mind um i knew from the very beginning that we would i wanted to get to a place where i could sell part of the business and then sell it again and then later continue on as a consultant so you had it in your mind that at some point you weren't going to be majority owner. Right. Right. Well, I had in mind that, um, that was part of a, an eventual exit strategy. Uh, a friend of mine has started and sold several large businesses and I went to him week two of doing this. He said, well, I'm not sure what to advise you, but you have an exit strategy. And I said, no, I've only been thinking about this for two weeks. So, well, you're at least a week late. So you need to start developing an exit strategy. And so I began to always think about that. And, and that, re- in concrete terms, that meant that while we were, um, while we we're building the business, we had to make sure our accounting was tight and the reporting methodologies, for example, using GAP, the generally accepted principles of accounting. We had to follow all these things pretty closely so that when a private equity firm looked at us, we didn't look we didn't look messy right? and we right. wanted it to be transparent. So that was, um, that was always part of it from the beginning. Obviously there was a lot of things we still had, we still had to do and solve after, after they wanted to buy the business and it wasn't perfect, but it was, it was a far cry from the first year or two that we had started the business. But it, it, it's a great tool that you, you, we're given that advice from early on, which is to start with the end in mind. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's such great advice. It's one of those giant principles that you never want to let go of. Um, and there's, you know, there's a few of those you get along the way from certain people. And, you you, I, you know, there's there's certain mantras that you develop as as a business owner and as a person you always you always have to keep close. Uh, one that one that I always I always use when I'm hiring people as a as a way to determine if they're going to be a good fit for us or not is I use the mantra of the, the truth and kindness balance. And there's a there's a proverb that talks about truth and kindness, um, actually binding it and wearing it around your neck. It's sort of like a, a medallion, if you will, right? And the point being that it's a constant reminder that these two things have to be in balance. If we're only concerned about truth, and I'll equate truth to being financial reports, and we're not concerned about kindness, we have a miserable place to work. Mm -hmm. If we only care about kindness, well, we eventually drive the business to zero and lose the employees because we have no concern for profit. We're just wanting to make everybody happy. Right. And so right. there's there's a balance there that we use when I'm talking. And it's a little bit tricky because, you know, when you're interviewing people, you can't really evaluate all those things. So you have to do your best to um, see where they're at. And, and then in everyday situations, there's a whole... I'm surprised at how many times there are that we really have to stop and think about where are we at with that and how do we apply that more accurately? It's, it's a constant, it's a constant tension. Oh yeah. But it's a, it's a great like check and balance. Like you mentioned in terms of if you, if you swing, they're both great things to have, but if you swing too much on one side, you're going to lose on the other. So, I mean, your description was great. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's really worked well for us. You know, I, I, I had an employee, as an example, I had an employee come a couple of years ago and he had really blown it, totally forgot his assignment and it made me look bad to the customer. And he came in and we talked about it and he said, well, I forgot. I said, well, did you? He said, yeah. I said, you're dressed, right? He went, well, yeah, of course I'm dressed. I said, well, you didn't forget to get dressed because you cared about how you looked when you came to work. It was very important to you when you woke up this morning. And I think it wasn't that you forgot about the assignment. I think you didn't care enough. And he was a little upset, but I said, look, um, I think we can get through this, but I have two, two requirements. One, I'm going to give you six months to show me that you care. And then we're going to give you a raise. But we have to put that path on pause while we demonstrate, you demonstrate to me that you care. And so I had to, I had to give him some truth. And then after six months, he performed super well. And then the kindness kicked in. I said, you know what? You you did a great job. Here's the promotion and raise of promise. And we um, we have had no issues since then. We understand each other. So it's kind of a, a little example. Well, that's a great example. I, I want to take you back to the to the sale that you had with the private equity firm. And I just wanted to comment that it's, it, it was the due, dil, due diligence process for anyone who's been through it is not a fun thing to, to do. <laughs> but, but it sounds like you were as pre prepared as you can be before you start that process because you were already thinking about it. We were, we were as prepared as you can be. I mean, there are a lot of, there were a lot of late nights. There was a lot of stress um, from, from every side, my business partners at the time didn't want to sell the business. Um, I had felt like we couldn't, we, we, I really me and this business could not move on without a larger partner. And I knew the larger partner was not interested in bringing them along. So there was a lot of stress there and it put a stress on my friendships with them, which mm -hmm. it worked out at the end, but that was, that was stressful. Um, and you can't prepare for everything. There are so many questions that come up and, you know, some of them are designed for them to ascertain the strength of the business. And some of it is designed to help them bring the cost of the business down. And it, it requires a large amount of time and effort. And thankfully, I had a great investment banker. I had somebody who I could call any time, day or night, when things became confusing or stressful to my wife and I. 
he would meet us at our house. He could spend two hours explaining it to us for the fourth time because we were engaging in a lot of terms and being immersed in something that was mm-hmm. completely mm-hmm. unfamiliar to us. Um, and it was, I can't even tell you how many nights I didn't sleep at all. I mean, so many nights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Um, we got there. <laughs> Right, you did, and, and and I know it's two years later, but congratulations. <laughs> well, no, I, I I appreciate it, and you know the average time that this company keeps a business is five years. So, if if that average holds true, we're halfway into the next exit. Very nice, and Very that nice. will, and I, we'll see where that goes. Um, so that's and that's something we're preparing here for every day. Right. So switching gears a little bit, I got to bring up, you brought it up earlier, the COVID question, but you know, your clientele, as you mentioned, comes from the entertainment industry. And from what I understand, most of the productions just completely shut down, like the rest of the, the, the state, so to speak. So how, what happened with Rat Pack and how did you adjust? So after about March 17th, all the revenue stopped cold. Mm. And... Mm. What we really did is we just controlled the bleeding. So we did two things. We controlled the bleeding. So we had to lay off a number of people. Of course, we kept paying, excuse me, we kept paying everyone's health insurance. Uh, we didn't want people to be out of work and not have insurance. So there was that. But the, the other thing we did is we kept engineering on and I worked very close with engineering to plow through developments so that when we got to the other end of this COVID, we had new products developed. Because one of the things that I realized very early on is our customers, the day after this would get over and they'd start filming again, already had a number of our products. And as production ramped up, they wouldn't need those pre-existing products. We had to get new things out. So while we're, while we're all locked down, we're also very busy with finishing development on new products. And it was really strange because on one hand, the business is dead. And on the other hand, we're trying to give birth to something new. It ended up working out because what happened as we started to come out of the, the COVID a little bit and production started up a little bit, almost 100% of the sales were with these new products. And it really created the momentum for us to get going. And it gave us a chance to do repairs and changes and modifications to the products before we got them out to the the larger audience. So it was, it was an investment. And remember we're making that investment while we're also controlling our bleeding. Right. And so we had a lot of financial calls. It was, it was difficult from a banking point of view because we're, we do asset based lending and that can be really tricky during a crisis. Mm. Um, it was also good because it, it forced us to keep our debt down. So as as revenue came in, we had to continually pay off that line of credit. So even though we, you know, obviously we had a, a very bad quarter, um, we're not in a bad position at the moment. Well, that's good to well, hear. That's good to hear. Yeah. We, obviously, we don't have a lot of EBITDA. Our, uh, the EBITDA is, is low, but our, thankfully our... Our, our debt did not become an overwhelming albatross around our neck. So we're happy about that. Yeah. So taking COVID out of the picture, someone comes to you and says, I was working my, my day job and I came up with this idea for a product. What's the one piece of advice you'd give them? Uh, it happens all the time. And one piece of advice uh, you know, I tell people, you you have to have the financial, mental resources to do it. Don't start it unless you can finish it. Because uh, I tell them, you're not going to be able to spend a few thousand dollars and get anywhere, except the loss of a few thousand dollars. So, uh, for example, I have a customer now we're doing an OEM project for, and we're working with him very closely. Um, and... He followed my advice and had made sure he had plenty of resources to get the product done. And you explained that, look, there's going to be a lot of missteps along the way. There's not going to be, there's not going to be a freedom of any stress. It's just going to happen. 
And so they had to have the resources. So you have to get your wife on board or a significant other. Um, otherwise, your personal situation is going to overwhelm your business and you're going to have to pick one. And he's been able to main, maintain that and work in that. Um, you know, the, I mean, those, that's the one, the one major piece. There's other things that, you know, simple business advice, you know, if, the, if you know, if it's too easy, probably everybody else is doing it, like printing t-shirts, for example. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the, the, the barrier of entry has to be high enough to make it worthwhile, unless you have what I call the unfair advantage. Um, like in my case, I was developing products for my friends. So I didn't have to spend years developing a customer base. I already had a good portion of the customer base at my at my disposal. So, you know, there's a few of those criteria that you can probably find in any book, but um, but they're always true. <laughs> That's why they're in almost every book. On, on top of the one bit of business advice, make sure you have the capital and your significant other on board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're not disregarding basic rules. For example, the barrier of entry, it has to be high enough that somebody else can't come after you right away. In our case, with this business, the barrier of entry is pretty high. You know, developing electronic products is not small. Um, you also have to have a certain amount of capital. And most of all, I tell people, try to have an unfair advantage. And by unfair, I don't mean unfair to other people. I just mean... Maybe, maybe leverage is the better word. Mm, so my mm. situation, a lot of my early customers were friends, people I'd worked with over the years. So I had the advantage of not having to cold call them because I could just call them. So that's, oh, I mean, if you have that, you have 90% of it, really. No, I, I love it. And I love how you made a reference to resources. And it wasn't just financial. So that, that that's a key thing. Well, yeah, financial is only one of the resources for sure. You know, I mean, if it wasn't for my wife, I would not have this business. Um, I I will never forget the day that I I told her, "Hey, we're when we go, we were on vacation, we were in Kauai, and I popped out of the swimming pool, and she was sitting in the, the lounge chair, and I said, I just had I just had a vision of what our future is." And I'm going to quit my job and we're going to develop this company. And, and thankfully, you know, she said, okay, I don't know what that means yet, but okay. <laughs> and, and she never wavered from that. Now there are moments in which the stress was overwhelming for her too, but um, she never regretted that. that. That's, that's very nice to hear. And I, I have something similar where my wife was like, if, if, if you do, your job, your new company, like you've done everything else in your life, you'll be fine. <laughs> and that, well, that's, that's that, a great compliment and advice. Yeah, it was perfect. Cause, but I always tell new founders that if you got to get your family to say yes, or your significant others to say yes to what you're doing. Cause like you said, there'll be that, that friction that, that you're going to be, uh, you're already fighting a lot of friction and a lot, you're going against the current already. You don't, you don't need additional friction or, no, you, you need you need you need as many allies as you can get, and that's you know it's, it's really hard to understate how important that is because those first two years of starting a business, I mean it's stress for me it was panic attacks it's insomnia, it's it can be incredibly hard, and you have to be able to get through that, and you're going to need somebody to help you get through that. I, I think people make the mistake of trying to do that alone. I can remember a couple times when I wasn't sure if we were going to make it or not in the business, sitting in my car, not wanting to drive home and sitting there for a couple hours thinking, do I drive home today and tell my wife I'm sorry? Or do I drive home and tell her we're going to make it, but it's going to be hard. And I was not sure. I said, honey, I'm sorry. Um, I blew it. The business didn't work. We're going to have to find a new way to make a living. Um, and every time I went back home and told her, look, it's been a tough day, but we're going to make it. She always, she always had my back. Wow. So other than your wife, what is inspiring you right now? Um, 
one of the things that my wife and I are inspired by is the ability to take a certain amount of the benefit we've had and give it away. Mm. So we, mm. we have a donor advised fund that we use and uh, I won't get into all the implications, but basically means that you can, you can put all your money that you want to give away into a certain fund and you get all the tax benefit. At, at the same year you give the money, and then you can give it away the rest of your life. And But while you're in the process of giving it away, it's in a fund. So that fund is growing and making money, so you have more money to give away. And the ability to do that and see the impact it's having is great. I mean, there's personal things we can do too, whether it's helping a family member get through college or things of that nature. But, you know, when you, we become associated with certain organizations and and you see that you're like during this COVID time, we were able to help out because we have this fund mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. it's really, it's really important to us. And it's a part of our, it's a part of our budget the rest of our lives. No, that's great. And it's great to hear that you're giving back and you've given back internally for your, for your company and, but also out to the community. How, yeah, how do we're, people, how we're how do super people, blessed. So, yeah. So how do people get a hold of you if they want to follow up on your journey? Sure. Um, I mean, you can email me, craig at ratpackcontrols.com. Okay. That's probably the best way um, to, to get a hold of me. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Um, so, you know, and I would, I always welcome, I, I, it's a little bit harder right now, but we always welcome guests. And anytime somebody wants to be on a similar journey, I'd be happy to help them. Wow, that's great. Well, Craig, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your journey. Oh, I really enjoyed it. And thank you for doing this because I've enjoyed listening to your podcast and I know it's helping other people. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks again, Craig. Awesome. Bye for now. Until next time, Bizmode family, this is your host, Alex Bruno, Bruno Group Inc., Bizmode Podcast. Keep your family first. Always strive for perfection. Don't forget, none of this is legal advice. By the way, what happened to peace? Peace.